because we thought there was something we can do in Ethiopia. We've got experience in the United Kingdom, but there's something also to learn in Ethiopia. So we thought there's a need to, for us to kind of organize ourselves and work. So we, when we knew that the World Press Freedom Day was going to take place in Ethiopia, we thought we should actually work with UNESCO and organize a panel discussion. So we took that opportunity and partnered with the International Observatory for Human Rights, known as IOHR. And it's globally known, actually, for doing, for doing human rights campaigns. We are keen because this is the right time to help the transition in Ethiopia. We, we think we should step in. If it's not us, then who? If it's not now, then when? So we are determined to bring our experiences, but at the same time learn from the people in Ethiopia and then kind of exchange. So without further ado, I'm going to do this. Trish Lynch, who's going to be leading this panel discussion. Trish is actually a very seasoned journalist, former Sky News and CNN reporter, and now she anchors what we call IOHR TV. In different languages, and in January of this year, we launched the world's first dedicated human rights television program, television channel. It's amazing. There hasn't been one before, but we are now the world first, and we will be documenting events like this here today. Now, as we know, being a journalist has always been a dangerous profession because by being a journalist, you run towards the danger, you run towards the conflict. But added to that, violence against journalists is an epidemic. If we look at the figures from Reporters Without Borders, last year, 2018, was the worst year on record ever to be a journalist. 99 journalists were murdered, 348 were imprisoned, and 90 were taken hostage. Now those figures are getting bigger every single day, and that's just in a 12-month period. And of those 348 that were imprisoned, many had a trial without any legal representation. They experienced violence, terror, torture, and many had campaigns of intimidation targeted at their families. In many countries, journalism has been rebranded as terrorism, and as we know, if you're a terrorist or a spy in any country, it comes with a very lengthy jail sentence, as we're going to hear later on today. So what we need in place is a framework, a political um, protection mechanism in place to guarantee the safety of our journalists and to end impunity and to hold those responsible and to make sure that they are punished. On our panel today, we will hear firsthand exactly what it's like to be on the receiving end as a journalist when there is no protection framework in place to safeguard you. And the stories that you will hear are incarceration, torture, violence, the list goes on. Um, so without further ado, as Becca Lay would say, let's now move on and I will introduce our panel to you. I'd like to introduce Ruth Nasoba. Now, Ruth is the deployments editor at the BBC World Service. She has over 17 years experience working in print and broadcast media in East Africa. Uh, she worked for the Kenya Broadcasting Company and later joined BBC World Service, working both in East Africa and the headquarters in London. I'd like to welcome Befa Gadu. Hi, Lou. Befa Gadu is a writer, a blogger, and a democracy activist. He's the deputy editor of the Addis Maleda, which is a weekly newspaper, and he is also a columnist. In 2012, along with eight other colleagues, he co-founded the prominent and multi-award winning Zone 9 Blogging Collective, which is a platform for blogging and activism. He's worked for many human rights organizations, including Article 19. He's gonna share with us uh, the times when he was jailed four times he was not found guilty on any of those times, and yet he spent 18 months in prison. We will hear from Valerie P.A., who is my colleague, and she's also the director of the International Observatory of Human Rights. Valerie uses her global TV experience and digital transformation to highlight human rights violations globally through the various channels, and as I mentioned, our um, world first dedicated human rights TV station. We also hear from Sergas Yadeta. Sergas is the co-founder of ELCO. 
She's also a colleague of Bekele, who we just heard from. She's a journalist and a communication specialist. She's worked for national and international clients right across the world. She has experienced media relations in the hard news environment, managed online activities, and many more. We will hear from Wobushet Taye, who I'm sure most of you are familiar with. He was arrested in June 2011 before being convicted on terrorism charges in January 2012, where he was sentenced to 14 years in prison. His arrest came soon after he published a column criticising the ruling party. He served seven years of that sentence uh, before he was pardoned and released in February of 2018. I'd also like to welcome Alistair King-Smith, who is the coordinator for Global Campaign on Media Freedom, Foreign and Commonwealth Office. You're all very welcome. Um, Valerie, if I could start with you, please, just to give us an overview of just how bad the situation is. Why are we here? This is about press freedom around the world. And I think one of the things that I'm most concerned about as an advocate is looking at how do we protect our journalists? How do we keep that protection at an international level, at a regional level, and at a local level? Now, it's a real joy to say that I'm not advocating for any locked up journalists in Ethiopia. It is such a, a privilege to be able to say that there are no journalists in prison here today. And I want to work out how we keep it that way. But a lot of what IOHR does is about advocacy, but action. And I'm absolutely delighted that there are so many of my colleagues and, and the NGOs, we have RSF here and CPJ and Article 19, and these are guys who specifically deal with press freedom. With IOHR, we do uh, press freedom as one of our key pillars, but we also get involved and, and advocate for um, statelessness, counter-extremism, refugees, among other things. However, today, when we came to Ethiopia, the first thing that we wanted to do is to meet the next generation of journalists, because part of the reason that we're talking about protection is to protect that next generation. So we, we spent yesterday with um, the students at Addis University, and we took the panel really to talk to them about what it means to have free press, but also what it means to have a society that protects you. So just to give you a little bit of background, today, um, RSF uh, index came out very recently, and Ethiopia has gone up 40 places, which is unprecedented. It's gone up um, to 110, which is fantastic. But last year, globally, as Trish was sorry, this year, globally, eight journalists have already been killed, one citizen journalist and one media assistant. Four in Afghanistan, three in Mexico, one in Ghana, and one less than two weeks ago in the UK. And I think, for me, with the death of Lara McKee, it really identified in the UK that we haven't had a, a journalist murdered in 20 years. But with the situation that we have with Brexit, with um, political tensions, it's become you know, a, a daily occurrence around the world that journalists are under threat, not just from harassment, and, and um, we'll, we'll hear a little bit about that later from Ruth, but also from violence, from um, incarceration, um, and, and the industries themselves are under, we've seen in Turkey, um, media organizations being closed, uh, a lot of pressure being put on families. Um, across Africa, we're seeing the growth of um, fees being put on uh, blogging societies, websites, and so on. I think one of the things we were also looking at, currently there are 174 um, journalists in prison. Now, I think that number is a lot higher. I work a lot with um, exiled Turkish journalists. There are a lot of journalists that are currently not classified as journalists because they wouldn't sign up to a government um, accreditation card. So, you know, I, I, I think, again, it's really understanding how do we identify who's in prison, who's just being held without charge, um, and what there are a lot of global institutions that do that, but how do you do that at a local and a regional level to hold governments to account? Um, currently, there are 39 journalists in prison in Africa. Um, we've, we're looking at a 90% impunity rate for attacks on journalists and murder. Now, that's incredible. So, journalists that are trying to identify where there are human rights violations, where there are um, government violate, government issues, 90% of those cases are not solved. So something is not going right at, a, at an international level. 
So what we're calling for really is how to bring that waterfall of frameworks together, how to start at the top and calling for a UN special representative for the protection of journalists. And there, there are many NGOs that have been calling for that. And we're all here, so we have the opportunity to really start to drive that call forwards. The next part of that is at a regional level. We've got the African Union here, we've got different forums here, and again, where can we bring best practice, but where can we also bring pressure to bear? Because, as Trish said earlier, there are too many people being killed just for the crime of being a journalist. I think one of the other things that we've seen recently, I was very lucky to be at the launch of Trial Watch, um, which is coming from the Clooney Foundation, and as we heard, we'll hear from Alistair, um, Amal Clooney has been very gracious, and she's now the Special Envoy for the UK for Press Freedom. And at Trial Watch, we were really looking at a group of people that are trying to shine a light on what's happening in a trial court. So when something goes wrong for a journalist, are they going to get a free trial? Who's going to register? What happens next? And for me as an advocate, that's really important to know. How do I know what's happening? So I, I really welcome the launch of Trial Watch. And I think what we've also been seeing is other um, uses or to, to really enforce that law. So we've got the Wojcicki Act, which um, countries have been using pretty successfully to putting specific sanctions on specific human rights violators. And again, part of the problem that we have today, and we've seen it specifically in, in many regions, I, I do a lot of work in Iran, um, where the, the, the governments are saying, well, yes, actually, I don't really care about the international environment. Um, I'm going to do what I want to do in my own country. So part of today and part of the discussion I want to have is, first of all, what happens when that goes wrong, and we've got some incredible people who've, who've been on the wrong end of that, but also as a collective group, what can we go for to really protect journalists moving forwards? But let's really hear from the people who've got the experiences. I'm going to pass now to Sergut. I haven't worked as a journalist in Ethiopia. I've worked as a journalist in UK. My experiences when I was working as a journalist in UK first, I used to come to Ethiopia, but I was afraid to tell anyone, the immigration officers or anyone, that I work for a newspaper in the UK because there's no law protecting you here in Ethiopia at that time. Now it's a privilege and I'm delighted to say that I've been working in UK as a journalist for a long time and I will be happy to come and work in, U in Ethiopia as a journalist. This is uh, a new thing for us, for Ethiopians who lived in London and who want to come here and work as a journalist in Ethiopia. This is what, one thing that I really want to say. So thank you, and uh, I'm really looking forward to hearing from uh, the journalists who have experienced this at the sharp end, because governments need to listen more to identify what can be done, as uh, we've heard from Valerie and others, uh, and as you outlined, uh, uh, Trish, the, the, the shocking figures and the escalating problems that are occurring in many countries, but also the trends in places that historically have been good at media freedom, uh, there are risks and problems there too. Um, so I think you're absolutely right to think about the international frameworks. There's some very positive language internationally, um, but when you look at how um, uh, these are being applied, um, the picture is really not good. And a lot of uh, governments uh, sign up to commitments, but they're not being implemented. So why I agreed to uh, join uh, this panel today, um, some of you will have heard me talk um, earlier today about the global campaign on media freedom that we're running, is because actually I think this joining up between the international, national, and local level is exactly what's needed. And we're going to need to be creative to do that so that we can bring civil society, media, governments together, multilateral organisations, regional organisations, to come up with the right initiatives uh, that will make the difference. Um, one of the reasons why Jeremy Hunt, um, our um, uh, Foreign Secretary, uh, decided to launch this global campaign uh, was not just because of the issues facing journalists generally, uh, but because it is also so critical to everything else we are trying to achieve, whether that's democracy, whether it's human rights, whether it's economic prosperity, without truth, without information that we can rely on, and without the powerful being held to account, we're not going to be able to succeed at everything else uh, we want. And so um, what he is determined to do is to find ways to reassert the international taboo 
against attacks on journalists. And what I'd really like to take away from this session, I think, is ideas about how we can then assert, get political will behind national frameworks so that there are national commitments by governments that actually lead to tangible action and then take that down to the local level. So I think if we can today in this session come up with some of the ideas about what are the sorts of elements that should go into those frameworks and what would make the difference, I can then take that away, the rest of us can take that away, we can use this new momentum behind the global campaign to get more governments and organisations involved. Oh, thank you. Uh, good afternoon. First, I want to express my happiness uh, for celebrating World Freedom Day uh, in my country, because uh, we Ethiopians know what it means to pay a lot. So, uh, you know, uh, as, as you said earlier, uh, according to uh, CPJ reporters, uh, in 2018, about uh, 54 people were deliberately killed for uh, carrying out their their duties. So, in our country's case, uh, including me, uh, about seven, eight journalists were uh, in jail. So it's so hard. Uh, let me come to the solution. I think um, two kinds of solution are there. The first thing is uh, from the government side, and um, secondly, from you know uh, independent organization or institutions. Um, from the government, uh, there are three branches. So the um, legislative uh, uh, branch making laws that ensuring journalists' well-being because uh, that that was the problem. Uh, those, that a bundle of uh, problems in Ethiopia. The second one is the judiciary part. It, 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 it interpret the laws so. Uh, according to the aim, in fact, according to the institutions or constitutions. The third one is the uh, executive part. It must enforce the law and investigating every report which uh, presents to the executive uh, part. And uh, secondly, uh, strengthening uh, that uh, independent organizations or institutions are crucial point so uh, shortly you can you can see that way uh, it's hard uh, you know um, passing the years in prison uh, I think uh, that these are past but there are um, something to do even so we are going to that thank you tell me about the Tell me, if you would, about the kind of protection, if any, that you had when you were arrested. Did anybody come to your help? Was there anybody there to take your hand and to try and guide you through this? Was there any legal... In Ethiopia, there is no, no problem with uh, laws or something like that. Uh, our lawyers come in trying to help us, but politically, uh, all decisions were uh, taken by politically. So, uh, there was no, no way to protect us. So that's why um, I'm saying strengthening independent institutions like Media Association or Human Rights Association in Ethiopia. Uh, in fact, we are now working on improving um, press freedom, no, press, press law, and like that. So that may help us to just um, to protect journalists here. That way. Just to give us an idea of the kind of treatment you had when you served seven years of a 14-year jail sentence, what was your day-to-day -day life like? Were you tortured? Were you in solitary confinement? Could you have access to books, have visitors? Well, uh, we stayed in a black room. Uh, I wrote about two books in prison, but uh, no paper and no pain were uh, allowed to enter, but we had um, a means to do that. Uh, I was denied to take any medical medication, so it, it was hard. Uh, we are visited monthly for about uh, 10 minutes, so uh, it, it was hard even uh, to say something, uh, untold story. So thanks to God, uh, we have seen these days. Mm. Thank you for sharing that with us. I'd like now to come to uh, the cafe to the camp, please. My time, especially the longest one, is like you have uh, mentioned it. It was 18 months in prison, and it was 
uh, we, we were detained in trials, but never convicted until then. So uh, the first 80 days, we have been in, in Ma'akalawi. Uh, I'm, I'm sure some of you have heard about it. It is now uh, closed, and the government promised to make it a museum because it used to be a torture chamber, at his, as it is uh, mostly called. So the, the treatment in that detention center was uh, very bad. Uh, personally, I was uh, tortured and also uh, forced uh, to make confessions of self-incriminating things, as if I have been writing to instigate color revolution and uh, also to instigate uh, violence. So that was a forced confession. Uh, so it was um, it was a nightmare, a nightmare for me uh, personally. I think that is the worst time in my lifetime, uh, the time I, I've uh, had in Makalawi. Uh, regarding legal representation, yeah, uh, our friends and uh, family members hired us, me and my colleagues, lawyers, but. Uh, we barely have access to those lawyers. Uh, personally, for the first 80 days, it was only two days that I could see my lawyer, and it was only for five minutes each when I, when I uh, could have access to, to the lawyer. So, and there were policemen around, so it was not even a safe uh, situation to talk to. Uh, our lawyers back then, it was in 2014. Uh, most importantly, there was also there were about five uh, uh, journalists association back then. They were uh, defendants or justifiers of uh, government actions. When they were asked by journalists, they told uh, the media that we are not journalists. Uh, they, they say that they don't know us the, uh, or anything. So it was usually from foreign or international organizations that the international community learned about our arrest and the injustice against us. So the protection uh, for, uh, for us, the bloggers, the online bloggers, and also uh, other journalists who were detained uh, by, by the time, uh, and Skinder and others, including Roya Talamu, who is, uh, who is in exile, uh, they were all in prison, and uh, it, is, it was mostly some independent journalists who were willing to risk their safety, who spoke about them, and also uh, it was international communities that actually echoed, echoed the, the injustice in here, not anyone else. On a local level, what frameworks do you think need to be put in place so that you and your colleagues can carry out your job? If you had a blank piece of paper, what three, what would be on that list? Uh, well, uh, there are actually multiple, but, but uh, the most important one, I think, is journalists defending or standing for one another is the most important thing, uh, in, in my opinion. Uh, like, like I mentioned earlier, there were about five journalists associations previously, but none of them actually defended uh, or uh, told the stories of journalists who have been experiencing intimidation, arrest, uh, and a lot of suffering. So. Uh, there must be independent journalists who stand up for other journalists who are uh, under intimidation for doing their jobs. This is the most important thing. The other thing, uh, yes, I told you that we had lawyers, but there are also, um, I mean, the, the, there were only a few uh, lawyers who were willing to defend such cases because when a journalist is jailed for their job, especially for criticizing the government, the, even the lawyers are afraid of defending those defendants because it's like uh, standing against the government in the context of authoritarian understanding. So uh, it was difficult uh, to get lawyers uh, because 
there were only a few uh, lawyers who are willing to stand for journalists under prosecution. The other thing, there is also a financial capacity problem for journalists to pay uh, such expenses. So there must be a means to support journalists, especially when they are in, in, in troubles, when they are intimidated and also hurt. The, uh, I remember there was a journalist uh, who was charged. He used to write for uh, Ethiopia Headdown newspaper. And he was uh, he reported a corruption case in Hawassa University and the university. I mean the, the people involved uh, pressed charges against him. So he had to go to travel every time to Hawassa City to defend himself. And he was uh, hit by a bad judge, a car uh, that he still believed. Uh, orchestrated by the perpetrators of the corruption. So uh, he had no money uh, to hire a lawyer to defend that case. He had no money to get uh, treatment for the accident uh, he faced while he went there for his case. Uh, up until now, he is paralyzed. So there are such kind of challenges uh, for the journalists. So I, th I think still the, those associations will be the best ways to uh, counter challenge such, uh, such sufferings. Thank you. Ruth, if I could come to you now, you have traveled over broadcast. You're working closely with women's groups. Tell me about the dangers of working in some of the most hostile parts of Africa, but particularly as a woman and the added danger that that gives you. Um, from my own uh, personal experience, I, I would say that uh, a woman often has to work uh, as uh, twice as hard as a man, because uh, one, it's uh, just as you see, you know, biologically women are a bit disadvantaged in terms of uh, when you you are being assigned or when editors in newsrooms are looking at story allocation, they would want to first of all look at the safety of a journalist. Uh, and, uh, and uh, the defense mechanism that they would put when they go out on the front line. So you'll find that most, uh, in most uh, occasions, they would uh, prefer to give the assignments uh, to the male counterparts instead of the females. And then uh, the other thing that uh, you have to contend with, which is an elephant in the room, is that there's quite a lot of uh, sexual harassment and exploitation uh, from uh, the news sources, one, and also within the newsrooms, that it makes it very difficult for women sometimes to prove themselves, even if they merit and deserve to be in positions uh, that they are in. There would always be you know, the, the, the silent uh, mamas behind them, how did she get into that position, and how, 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 why her and not me. And so uh, often women are faced by these sort of challenges. Uh, that uh, you're trying to deliver your duties and responsibilities, but at the back of your mind that those who are also not uh, looking at you as somebody suitable for that position, but more uh, uh, defining you uh, as you look uh, biologically. And then there's also the other bit of uh, women trying to balance, you know, work and life, you know, besides being uh, working full time in the newsroom and in the field, you go home and you become a mother or a wife, sometimes a sister and a daughter, and the family duties that you have to run to and, 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 and to balance between you know, your life at work and life at home. It becomes quite difficult. I think one would suffice because there's no difference where, whether you're a man or a woman when you're faced by the challenges that my colleagues here, Bifkadu and uh, Wubshet have talked about. Because we face all similar experiences across the, the fields, whether you're reporting from Kenya or from Somalia or from South Sudan. You know, as a journalist, ordinarily we are supposed to be the conscious of society. We are supposed to be going out there to expose the wrongs that are happening in society. And often we are targeted by the same people who sometimes have indiscretions that they don't want journalists to bring out. And when journalists do so, they become targets of uh, retaliation from uh, the people that they've talked about or, they, or that they have reported or they have exposed. And I think this can only be minimized if there would be strong and reliable mechanism and protection, not just for women, but for all who are working in the newsroom and in the field. And if I could just give you uh, one final question, because you have worked so extensively in Africa, 
we know that Ethiopia has really cleaned up its act, and as we've heard for the first time since 2004, there are no journalists in jail. So initially, it's looking really positive, but the rest of Africa is not so good. Egypt has 23 journalists in prison, Eritrea 15, Cameroon 7, and Rwanda 4. In total, 61 in Africa are currently behind bars. Do you think what we see here in Ethiopia, do you think that could be rolled out to the rest of Africa? Um, for me, I would say that um, um, although Ethiopia, as you say, the, the press is feeling much more freer at the moment because of uh, what uh, the reforms that have been instituted by uh, Dr. Abiy Ahmed's office, I don't think that is enough because already the CPJ, that's the Committee for the Protection of Journalists, in, has done a research in this country. It has spoken to a dozen journalists, and most of them are seeing that challenges still remain, including the risk of attack, uh, including uh, going out to places where there's been tension and uh, they have been you know, targeted. They're also not able to attract advertisers for their programs, for their, for their shows, for their stations, because people are still worried. They don't want to support people who are critical to the government. And I don't think that uh, the Ethiopian government has done enough yet. As we speak now, there's a council that has been established under the Attorney General to review a raft of laws that um, will restrict the press, such as the anti-terror uh, proclamation and mass media laws. And this is much replicated across the continent. Uh, in Tanzania, for instance, there is the, the electronic and postal communications regulation, which was signed into law in March, and they stipulate that all bloggers and all persons operating online radio and television streaming must secure a license fee and must pay to publish anything. In Kenya, uh, on the 26th of April, that's last month, just a week ago, the parliament approved the Computer and Cyber Crimes Bill uh, 2017, which uh, criminalizes the publication of false news and has hefty fines and lengthy prison terms for those who are found guilty of any offense. So uh, I would want to urge practitioners in Ethiopia not to be deceived by the euphoria and the excitement of the reforms, little as they are or uh, huge as they are, to institute a free press here, but to ensure that they have established building blocks that will help this country be able to have a, a media that is strong, that will be able to operate beyond the term of uh, uh, office of uh, the current holder of the prime minister's uh, office. Because when you tie such reforms to individuals and a close circle of the people that support him and forget about uh, uh, the legacy or the prosperity of uh, the profession, then uh, it becomes sometimes uh, an effort in futility. I can take you back to Kenya in uh, a post uh, President Daniel Arap Moy's tenure, in, that's around uh, 2003, during the uh, takeover of uh, President, uh, the then President Mwai Kibaki's uh, regime. There was so much excitement and Kenyans were voted to be amongst the most optimistic people in the world. But uh, within a period of about uh, five years, we saw what happened to the media. It was one of the actors that were used to incite uh, violence and uh, to spread uh, hate speech into the period uh, of uh, 2007, the election period. And you saw what happened in that country. About 1,000 people died in the post-election violence that followed uh, the, the tension that had been brewed in that period where so many people thought that Kenyans were optimistic. And what happened? It's because the media players forgot about the key uh, tools and roles that they were supposed to play, perhaps. One being self-regulation as a media, and also looking at what is the role of a media and what is our responsibility to society to ensure that we uh, remain objective and professional. So that's a, a challenge that I throw to the, the media players in this country. Thank you. So, Chris, if, if I could come to you, you're a journalist in the UK, but you've had many dealings in Ethiopia. Thanks, Teresh. Yes, in UK, uh, I've worked in Ethiopia and I've set up a school for children in Lalibela for 500 kids. And I have a, a lot of dealing bureaucracy in Ethiopia in the last 15, 16 years. And, I've, uh, and I have worked at UK as a journalist as well. The difference between um, the working in UK and working in Ethiopia, even though not as a journalist, is like in UK, when you work in UK, there are 
legal, legal frameworks in place to protect journalists. There are acts and legal laws that will protect you, and journalists have to know what they, could, they can do and what they cannot do. They have to be aware of the law and aware of the law and the act. For instance, there is a freedom, um, information freedom act, and there is the PCC. That the PCC is uh, an organization by uh, media, press media organizations, only by, for the printed media, and they self-regulate themselves. And in here, in Ethiopia, I haven't seen anything like that. The media and the journalists have to be aware of, con they should have a code of conduct, and they have to sign to it and follow it. If, there is, uh, if they broke the code of conduct, they should be asked by their own self-regulatory body. And they should censor themselves as well. This is one of the things I haven't seen in Ethiopia, and which is in UK. Uh, any public or public servant or any, uh, anyone from the public can ask the media or write a letter to the PCC and complain if there is a false information. And they will investigate and if the newspaper has, is wrong, they will be fined. There could be prison or there could be money. And in Ethiopia, working in Ethiopia, there are a lot of uh, regulations in place and there's a lot of bureaucracy, especially when you go down uh, local level. That's what I've experienced. And I'm hoping with a new government, with a new place, with a new system in place, uh, the bureaucracy and the system will be improved. So Amal Clooney um, has been appointed as Special Envoy, uh, primarily in recognition that actually one of the biggest issues that we face here, as uh, some of our speakers have said, are the issues around impunity and accountability. And therefore, having somebody uh, like Amal, who has extensive legal exp experience of representing journalists who have been uh, arrested or the families of those who have been killed, um, is a really important dimension to bring into the international space. And part of what she's going to do as Special Envoy is to bring together a high-level panel of legal experts from across um, uh, different uh, countries to bring together the best form of legal advice um, and then help to advise on what sort of legislation should be developed, picking up some of the comments that uh, several of our panellists have mentioned about how different parts of legislation or regulation are used to constrain rather than to facilitate uh, media freedom. So we think that that aspect around legislative frameworks is going to be really important. Now that needs to be backed up with other things um, and uh, part of Amal's role will be to look at how we can champion the global campaign and put real uh, weight behind it and draw in others who perhaps at the moment are not as active as we need them to be um, to tackle these issues. But we don't expect this to be an easy ride. Um, so for the UK government and for other governments, um, any independent figure like um, Amal as special envoy um, will also have a role in uh, holding us to account and for challenging. So uh, we are um, really, I think, looking at how can both the UK and other governments um, uh, really work together to address this so that we can actually springboard off the positives rather than often getting pulled down uh, by the negatives and really move that. So there's a very strong positive intent there. I think there's a lot to do to work this through. Um, we will be developing um, uh, the particular focus of both the panel and AML's role in the coming months, uh, looking towards the big global conference that we'll be hosting with Canada um, in uh, London on the 10th and 11th of July, where we hope to bring all the world's governments and civil society together to really look at how we can tackle these issues point because we often focus on the negative um, I think as uh, people talked uh, today about Ethiopia being a very positive example I mean Bekele the fact that you feel this is now the time to reinvest in Ethiopia and to come back and others uh, talking uh, Sagat and others are on the panel about how uh, you can really make a difference when there is a political will and a new opening um, we need to help other governments feel that it's worthwhile uh, doing the same and even in the places where there aren't so many challenges highlight the best practice, share that, and then um, uh, take things forward. So I think highlighting the positives and creating positive incentives is an important dimension alongside what we do through better accountability mechanisms and obviously holding people to account for um, problems as well. Elko has come to be able to share the experiences that you've got 
and a lot of this is about training and education. You know, how do you train journalists to, to have the right ethics, to have the right um, securities and protections, but also how do you train society to know, um, first of all, how to treat journalists, that they should be cherished, they shouldn't be attacked or um, suffer violence, but also educating a, a public on how to seek um, the right sources themselves. Because I, I know there's a big issue, I, I was very interested in the debate this morning around fake news uh, or misinformation, and I think part of that training that, that hopefully Elko can bring is really how do people identify your sources, your trusted sources. Um, you know, Ruth, you work for the BBC, I, I'm a big fan, and, and for me, I go to the BBC when I, I want to find out what's happening because I know it's independent. Um, and I think really that independence and that transparency is, is so important to, to actually underpin with a framework um, within country. So thank you for sharing that. Um, for us, press freedom is something that I really want us today in this forum and, and within the next couple of days to bring an action plan together because we have the opportunity to change this. We have the opportunity to bring these frameworks together and in this room, all of you have the ability to, to advocate for change. And I think, as Alistair has said, we've got this incredible opportunity. This is not just a one-off event. We've got this um, continuing flow of, of knowledge and information from here, going on to, to London and hopefully beyond that um, through to the UN in September. And I think what I would really ask is all of you to, to work with us, work with the other NGOs, work with the government groups here, and let's get some plans together on how we can actually do this. You know, at, with IRHR we advocate, we have our media channel, um, we are recording today, we do interviews, um, we advocate, we, we stand outside um, embassies and, and shout sometimes. But it's, it's got to be more than that. It's got to be a really joined up, cohesive approach if we're going to move this forwards to have something meaningful, and particularly here in Ethiopia. You know, I'd really like to come back in a year and say some of the things that we've developed today or developed in the next couple of weeks will be able to impact what happens, and particularly with the run-up to the election in the next two years. How do we get all these people singing from the one hymn sheet? So that is going to be really challenging. I, I have no doubts about it. But I think what is good is if we can galvanise first the top-level interest around this and inspire people to realise we need to put more effort into this field and it really is worthwhile for our own benefits and our, our country's benefits to do this. And then galvanise different perspectives into the top-level conversations on this but then take it down to each level. And I think a lot of this is going to be how is this translated um, down to different levels. Now, one of the ways that we're looking at doing that is finding those countries that are, like Ethiopia, really prepared to do something differently, um, make that next level of commitment. I hope that the July conference will see a number of governments uh, committing when they come to London uh, to making some national commitments around the sort of frameworks and the actions that they will take. Um, and then taking that not just from those countries and as they develop best practice, and as you said, it needs to be long term. It can't just be within a you know, year's time frame. We won't achieve success in that. But if we can then hold people to account for their commitments, but then take it to the local level as well. And the way that I've seen this work well on other uh, issues is if you have a few countries developing best practice and sharing that, sharing that in regions across other institutions, whether that's within the UN, uh, within uh, the Commonwealth, within other um, uh, fora, but then also taking it down to a local level and finding a few areas where you can really make it work so that the local police, the local prosecution uh, dimension is being tackled effectively and then hold that up as best practice that you can then cascade across the whole. It needs a determination over time, so I think it's going to be challenging, uh, but I think one can uh, do that. But we do need to make sure that that's sustained. And just one point on that. Yes, we're going to be spearheading this as the UK this year, but we're wrapping in other partners. Canada are co-hosting this year and will be committing to spearhead the global campaign next year. There would then be another partner who would do that in subsequent years each year so that this isn't something that gets dropped. And then we use these key moments in the year, like World Press Freedom Day, so it's not yet another conference, but actually can really sustain things each time. And as Valerie says, I think it's absolutely right. We should bring it back to this forum and others to then say, well, what has changed and what hasn't? When I stay in a prison for about seven years, um, it gives you an abundant uh, time. So um, we can discuss, uh, we can think, 
deeply uh, about um, freedom of expression, about our country. And uh, it was not only dark. Uh, I wrote two books about Ethiopian politics, about Ethiopian journalism, and everything. So uh, that's the first thing. Um, I also agree with Bafukadu. Uh, we are improving the press law by now, so uh, we will see the outcome. So anyway, uh, it makes it makes uh, by, we Ethiopian uh, psychologically strong enough when things are coming, we defend. So it was a good experience, by the way. <laughs> Thank you. Ruth was talking earlier about the new generation of journalists that are coming through and how different their job is going to be, particularly in Ethiopia, because currently, as we have said so many times, there are no journalists behind bars. What do you think has changed from these new people and the job that they will do now to the job they would have done two years ago? Yeah, uh, I, want, I, I want to mention two things. Yeah, you know, the, the new generation... Uh, the, Years ago, there was no uh, enough um, channel of like um, internet access and like that. So uh, by now, the, the draft uh, is coming, uh, you know, uh, head speech like that. So why it comes? Uh, because there's a bundle of bad speech of like that. So this new generation of journalism uh, must work professional ethics. The first thing is that. Uh, the second thing is uh, journalism by itself shaping communities' uh, thoughts. So it means uh, that it must be working in professional ethics, and that's all. So they have many chances, so they must use properly. Yeah. And do you think that adequate training is in place to make sure that professionalism is at the core of everything, so that this whole fake news and misinformation, disinformation, doesn't cloudy the water and fill the space where we want this critical independent journalism? Indeed, yeah. Yeah, I agree with that. Yeah. Uh, the makeup, makeup uh, trainings are needed. So in other countries, you can't see that, but uh, this country, you know, uh, we pass through bodies of the, the last 27 years. So that's true, I agree with that, yeah. I just want to ask you one final question. Yeah. Seven years of a 14-year sentence, and we just heard that Fekaji said that it wasn't all draft, that he had time to think and plan. What about you? What were those seven years like? What went through your mind? What did you occupy yourself with? Yeah, uh, as uh, I, I tried to mention earlier, uh, I'm a journalist, so uh, my plan was uh, as soon as I uh, released, just I started working as a journalist. So um, that's the hope of us, uh, journalists, uh, even to the country. Okay. I think it's great to have sessions like this, but we have an incredible opportunity to actually do something and move this forwards. So for me, I'd like to see at the end of this week and the next couple of months, a proper action plan for global framework, international, down to regional, down to local. I think there is a huge opportunity for us to do something meaningful and useful here, and I just don't want to waste it. So I would ask you all, take part in the debate, and let's see what we can do to actually bring, as the gentleman said, you know, bring ethics training up to date, bring law up to date. And I think, for me, it's about transparency. So on a global level, keeping that um, pressure to keep that transparency available. There are lots of great indexes. One of the things Trial Watch is doing is creating an index for justice, and I think for press freedom. Um, one of the reasons we're calling for a special um, representative at the UN is really to be the, the head of that um, press freedom, the, the place that you can come to, to make sh sure from an independent perspective that you can really engage across this waterfall of levels. My hope is that the journalists and the media organisations will get together and uh, set up a free self-censored organisation in place. So the media and the journalists will censor themselves before the government could censor them and there will be a code of conduct in place and they will sign up to it and the public will have access to the code of conduct and if they break it, they will be accountable and there will be transparency. 
And another thing I hope will happen is there will be a National Journalist Union of Journalists Association, very strong one, and with, uh, independently of the government, and no ethnic problems, and protect journalists, and help journalists when they're in trouble, legally, uh, help their legal costs, and uh, help them with training as well, organize trainings, and um, help them mentoring young journalists, and this is my hope will happen. Journalists themselves, I also hope that the media council that is existing, or anyone, will emerge as a self-regulatory body which prohibits the intervention of government. Uh, uh, I also hope for the legal reform to, uh, to, to uh, be completed very soon so that the reform, uh, the, the reform can have legal guarantee and also the institutions like the uh, broadcast authority could re-establish themselves in a way they serve the media to act freely. Uh, potentially, there will be some sort of tension as election is coming next year. Uh, there will be uh, too many competing forces and they want their narratives to be entertained uh, in each of the media outlets. So they try their best to manipulate the media uh, and the journalists, I hope the journalists will outsmart the politicians and the activists so that they can independently continue reporting uh, so that the, they, they uh, can be uh, a true servant of the general public. The voice has to come from within us. The, as they say, the wearer of the shoe is the one who knows where it pinches. We can't sit back and wait for governments to do it for us because most times we rely so much on their goodwill. And uh, we know that uh, even if there were the UN uh, frameworks and, uh, and uh, legislation, they can be rubbished very easily by governments. And uh, as we see, even the big brother, the US, doesn't care a lot about what the UN says and what it does. So who, who are our African governments sometimes to listen to you know, what is being done by uh, the international bodies? So if we, the voice starts from within us, we can force the change and we can ensure that uh, the reign of impunity in our countries does not uh, persist, does not continue. Because if you look, uh, you know, where are uh, we facing the threats from? It's from government officials, from politicians, from criminal gangs within our society, sometimes even from agitated mobs or communities that are not happy with what we are reporting. And uh, if we are going to wait for, for people to come outside, from outside to help us uh, have in place mechanisms to protect us, I think that will be a long shot. But uh, by and by, having said that, I think they're very important. We can't wish them away. And uh, because in the lack of uh, such protection, our work becomes very risky. And uh, before the help comes in, uh, it will be very difficult to even tell our, st our, our stories. I think, uh, like uh, Sir Good said, it's very important to look at uh, self-regulating, not censorship. Uh, we are journalists. We should be able to tell our stories without censoring ourselves, but regulating ourselves. So let's do it, starting off with the voice from within. Thank you. I'm working on uh, printing media. It is uh, uh, government considers this uh, printing media uh, as a luxury materials. You know, uh, we have about uh, 30 million uh, students in Ethiopia, so it must be revised. Uh, the, paper tax uh, uh, policy must be revised and I hope things will be good very soon. Yeah. I have uh, two hopes but I'm going to balance it with a commitment. My first hope is that no one experiences what um, uh, Wubschott and uh, Befecado um, have just told us about um, and that that does not happen. Uh, we all need to work together to make that happen. My second hope uh, is that we actually address um, uh, the um, uh, issues um, and use the uh, conference and the global campaign we have to get commitments around this set of issues. But my commitment on that uh, is to work with Valerie and anyone else who wants to be involved, but to really look at 
what are the vehicles that we could actually create that will make that a reality rather than, as uh, Valerie said, just, uh, just it's more talk. So something practical that makes a reality of those national uh, 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 frameworks coming to life. Thank our panel, and I'd like to hand over for the to Dr. Emmaius Kebedi, who is the co-founder of ELCO. Today's uh, talk on the need for UN international and local protection mechanisms for journalists uh, was brought to you by the Ethiopian Institute for Leadership, Communication and Organization, ELCO, and the International Observatory for Human Rights. Um, we had three elements to the talk. We had an international element, we had a regional element, and a local element. I like to work from local up, so let's start with the local. The local really looked at what the problems for the protection of journalists are. So we heard from Befikado Haile about his experience of persecution from the government, uh, how he was, had no access to lawyers, how he felt abandoned uh, by uh, five journalistic associations who disowned uh, him and his colleagues, uh, the Zone 9 bloggers. And he said that journalists standing for each other is an important mechanism to combat outside intimidation. He said that we should ha provide journalists with the means to defend themselves. So he talked about financial support, um, some protection as well, legal protection for, for journalists. One of the most touching things he said that he never wanted to compromise his freedom of expression and that really should have got an applause because uh, that's a, a major thing. Wubishet Taye, his colleague uh, within the Ethiopian Journalistic um, Society, um, gave us uh, his experiences as well. Uh, he looked at what the solutions could be. In terms of government, he said that there are three levels which uh, we should really address. The legislative, the judiciary, and the executive. And those three mechanisms of government need to ensure that they protect journalists, that they have the right laws in place, and that they enforce these laws of protection. He also spoke of the need to strengthen independent institutions whose aims are to support journalists. So that was the local level. We had um, our sister from Kenya, uh, Ruth Nesoba, who gave us her experience. And one of the things she said is that journalists are ordinarily supposed to be the conscience of society, and as such are regularly involved in exposing wrongdoings. And constantly, they are targeted by people whose indiscretions are exposed by journalists. So she said that we need to ensure we have mechanisms that protect these journalists. In terms of women journalists, she talked about the challenges of women in protection, perception, and the personal uh, challenges that they face as journalists. Uh, but she said that journalists, no matter whether they're men or women, should be afforded the same equal protection. She also touched upon Ethiopia's transition. While she recognized the reforms that were being made, she said it, it needs to be supported and it needs to ensure that it protects journalists. And she calls that journalists in Ethiopia and wider should continue to be to have a critical view of any new legislation that comes about in this area. But we then heard uh, in terms of the international le uh, level. So if I start with um, uh, our, our friend from the Foreign Commonwealth Office, Alistair King-Smith. Uh, Alistair talked about the, the need for government to listen more, to identify what's been happening, and also to keep the positive changes that have been happening. He told us about the global campaign for freedom, uh, free media, uh, which the UK Foreign Secretary Jeremy Hunt has launched, and the UK is partnering with Canada to develop uh, a conference in July, which we hope will continue and will support uh, the aims of World Press Freedom Day. Sirgut uh, Yadeta, uh, my colleague from ELCO, uh, spoke about the need uh, to ensure that there is a code of conduct that uh, could be 
adhere to through self-regulation by Ethiopian journalists. I think there are some moves towards that, and there have been some uh, co conversations, and we hope in future we will see that. She talked about her experience of working both in the UK and in Ethiopia, and she talked about the hopes that she has that the changes that have happened and the reforms that have happened will continue. Um, lastly, but definitely not least, Valerie Pei from uh, our partner group, the International Observatory for Human Rights, talked about IOHR's responsibility as an advocacy and action group. And in, in, in that vein, she called for a UN special envoy for the protection of journalists and to ensure that there were better international, regional and local protections for journalists. So a, a, a great uh, panel discussion moderated by a fantastic um, colleague of ours, uh, Tricia Lynch uh, from IHR TV. Um, so, you know, I would like to thank uh, everyone on the panel. I would like to thank IHR and ELCO for uh, providing us with this. If I may close with my own remark, um, I believe we can live in a free and fair society where protecting journalists is paramount in our world view. And I hope we'll move towards that. And I thank you all for coming to listen. Thank you.